Welcome everybody to Radicalized True Survives, episode 91. I'm Heidi Sigmund Kuda. We are going to be talking to our friend Brian Hansberry from the Media and Democracy Project. And you're going to learn how to protect yourself against foreign influence campaigns in news. Take a look. Right, Brian, we are so happy to have you here with us today. I feel um, just super grateful. And also, I'm very um, proud of the efforts of Fix Media now. I've watched it pretty much from its early days, and you guys have been so incredibly effective. And the fact that it's grassroots volunteerism is uh, really quite beautiful and inspirational for our viewers. And let's go ahead and walk people through your latest petition. Let's go ahead and start there. Sure, absolutely. And I would be remiss if I didn't, um, for the sake of people finding us, if they just rely on their ears, uh, that we, all of the things I'm going to talk about are, you know, part of the Media and Democracy Project, which Fix Media Now is a, is a sort of like uh, agitating wing of, if you will. But so uh, what we've just launched um, is something that we had previously worked on in 2022 as well uh, for the midterms. And um, I don't know if you know, but there's a big election this year. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've also noticed, but um, mainstream corporate media is is really letting us down and, and has been, you know, essentially since 2016. Um, but you know, we look out at the coverage of, you know, someone who is absolutely uh, radical and extreme and uh, their, whose actions are disqualifying. And all we sort of see is, is normalization, right, of this project to end democracy and a lack of context provided to all of us as we go about our lives and try to understand what's going on uh, just so we can uh, spend some time on one day and make a monumental consequential decision. So what we did is put together these guidelines for newsrooms, and uh, we're going to be sending an open letter that we hope everyone signs on to um, that is attached to these guidelines to the executives and publishers um, and the journalists at uh, major news organizations. Um, you know, a little bit of a uh, a little bit of some slack given to the journalists, right? Like this is a system like any other system we talk about that has its systemic problems. Um, but, you know, we need to be putting pressure on, on all points um, in order to affect change. So um, what the guidelines are, they're broken down into three sections, basically. Uh, there is uh, cover elections like they matter more than sports scores. There is protect Americans from uh, disinformation. And there is, uh, you know, explain threats to democracy, right? So we want these three things to be what news media is doing all of the time. And we really want to frame this project for everyone as like, you know, well, what am I, what am I doing? I'm signing on, like, how much of a difference is that going to make? But what we believe in is that, you know, everybody has to get out of a place of complacency. And it's going to take all of us to, um, you know, do what is the most important thing, which is change how we're all informed. Because unless we change how we're informed, uh, and unless the way we're informed has a massive public interest component to it, um, we're just still going to be falling for these disinformation efforts. Um, and we're really going to be at the whim of uh, you know wealthy people who want to manipulate public opinion. So really what these guidelines are is a framework by which all of you, everyone, can, you know, make choices about, you know, what media they consume. Uh, they can hold these guidelines up and, and see, like, you know, what aren't I seeing or am I seeing these these failures from the, the media I consume? And what can I do about that? Well, you can become part of your media landscape, right? Yeah. You can write letters to the editor. You can make choices about what you subscribe to, what you tune into on the television. Um, and so that's what this effort is about. And again, like if you were very upset that an election liar um, and participant in Donald Trump's um, attempted coup was hired by NBC, however briefly recently, and if you were upset about reading the reporting of the, um, you know, like thinking and decision making by the executives who made that decision, um, we're going to be sending this open letter that you sign on to to them. Um, and that's just not where it stops. You then have to become active. You have to get engaged and you have to care 
and push for more informative media. Thank you so much for that. Hi, Fi and I have a bunch of questions. Um, and, but before we move on to that, uh, I do want to point out that your petitions um, have been signed by very prominent people. And uh, be again, before we go on to some of the specifics of it, I'd like you to tell people about your other effort um, that actually has gained a lot of international news. Yeah, I mean, pretty cool for just a bunch of volunteers who, you know, make no money. <laughs> so we, um, you know, we watched as as Fox, uh, you know, lied uh, to the American public um, after the 2020 election. And uh, then, you know, Dominion, the uh, the voting machine uh, company uh, sued them. And in the, uh, you know, um, discovery and and over the course of that trial and reporting, we learned that um, it was proven in a court of law that a broadcast licensee, Fox and the Murdochs, lied to the American people just to improve their ratings and that those lies really were were part of what led to a insurrection, a coup attempt on our country. And so the FCC has rules uh, that say that non-broadcast misconduct, right, which would be lying on cable, right, broadcast is, you know, what's over the airwaves, non-broadcast misconduct can be so uh, egregious as to shock the conscience. Those are their words. Wow. And um, something you know, something can be done about that, including the removal of your ability to be a broadcast licensee. So mm -hmm. Fox has a station, Fox 29 in Philadelphia that was up for renewal. And um, right before uh, that renewal was sort of, um, you know, uh, stamped by the FCC, we, uh, we launched a petition to deny. We filed a petition to deny with the FCC. That was last July. Um, and all that it does is ask the FCC to open a hearing to consider the revelations of the Dominion case. To uh, We've also filed a motion for them to seek other discovery documents from other lawsuits. There's a shareholder lawsuits. There's the Smartmatic lawsuit, right? Do the investigation based on your own rules. There's no First Amendment right to a broadcast license. It's a privilege mm -hmm. that the FCC oversees and they have rules. They have rules about the character of the broadcast licensee. And so we're saying that it's very clear that this broadcast licensee, based on lying, knowingly lying to the American public, that's disqualifying. And you should look into that at the very least on behalf of the American public. That is so fantastic. And what's so wonderful is it's not just you saying that this is not a First Amendment issue. You have scholars, you have a uh, veteran GOP, uh, you know, uh, former um, uh, high profile uh, members of high profile administrations agreeing with you on this matter. So can you speak a little bit about some of the people who backed you up on this? Absolutely. I mean, we have you know, executives who were there at the beginning of the founding of Fox Broadcasting, mm. um, you know, they have uh, filed um, their own comments to the FCC on our behalf. Um, some of them were there in October when we went to the FCC and 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 pushed for them to, you know, grant a motion to, to get access to this other, you know, materials um, from these lawsuits. Um, we have Floyd Abrams, who's a First Amendment uh, champion, very respected person in, in the the field, the understanding of the First Perfect. Amendment, who, you know, came out recently and and said that Fox's arguments that this has anything to do with the First Amendment um, are absurd. Right. Mm -hmm. So we also also have former FCC chairman uh, who was a Republican. Um, and, and, you know, the, this is a bipartisan coalition. We have Bill Kristol. Yeah. Um, who, you know, I may disagree with um, about some things and he may disagree with me about other things. But but what we do agree on is uh, that we need to do something about media and democracy and specifically um, the egregious behavior of Fox and the Murdochs. I just I, I, I'm wondering, why is it that all of these government institutions that are supposed to be protecting Americans right? Protecting us from disinformation, protecting us from foreign influence operations, uh, protecting us from lies on the media. Um, 
every single one I've seen seems to be dragging their feet on this. Do you have any thoughts about why? Is it simply because there's not enough public outrage or what do you think is the reason? Well, I think that's an important piece that we that we really often forget in this sort of distracted, you know, Internet, phone, social media era that we live in that, you know, um, agitation by the public does uh, make things happen. So that is a missing component. But also, you know, you can't ignore um, regulatory capture, right? You can't ignore that, you know, the revolving door. A great example is Ajit Pai, right, who is Donald Trump's uh, FCC commissioner who, you know, came in from the industry, went right back out and started working in, you know, the telecom industry. Um, and you can't ignore the 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 really horrible attacks and strategy from the extreme right. Like we know that, you know, many of Biden's nominees um, and you can debate the merits of, of any nominee from from any president of any political persuasion. But what's specifically happening over the last couple of years is that people are being um, attacked. They're getting death threats. They're getting smeared publicly. Yeah. And, um, you know, for us, as it regards the FCC and what we care about most, Gigi Stone was a once in a lifetime public advocate who is going to be one of the five FCC commissioners. I mean, this person, Gigi Stone, is like any public interest, you know, person who cares about, you know, how much someone cares about everyone in their government. Like she was the ideal person and she was smeared. There was a, a concerted documented effort to smear her and she rescinded her nomination. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that was all part of trying to get a three, two majority um, on the democratic side so that some things could happen because, mm -hmm. you know, to be honest on the Republican side, there is much more evidence that, you know, they're pro industry uh, and, 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 you know, not for the people. Um, and so, you know, now we have Anna Gomez in the FCC, to break that deadlock and maybe we're about to see something move on net neutrality, which has been reported in the news. Um, but so that's what, that's what I would say. Hi fi. It's there's, there's these major multiple things that are happening. Um, and you're seeing though, that once we get, you know, people who really care and who are really solid, um, real, real change on behalf of the people can happen just like what's happening with Linda Khan um, at the FTC. So, Great question, great answer, uh, and made me think about so many things. First of all, the fact that the fixed media now is the agitating branch of this group media and democracy is really important because what did we see when the people rose up against NBC, uh, putting Ronna McDaniel on as a commentator? We saw that canceled. So it was the people rising up. It was the people within the organizations rising up. And that shows that people need to exercise their power. What did we see during the Dominion lawsuit? We basically saw very cynical uh, messages back and forth between high profile uh, anchors um, uh, at Fox, knowing that they were promoting lies, knowing they did not like uh, Rudy Giuliani or Sidney Powell, but as you said, doing it because they were worried that Newsmax was going to get a larger share of their market. So we saw this very cynical uh, game being played, but unfortunately, the minds that are impacted by watching Fox day in, day out are not getting the memo that they're being lied to. So let's give, give me a comment on that, and then I have a follow up. I, I, I guess my comment would be that everyone listening should watch this um, documentary from this woman, Jen Senko, called yes. The Brainwashing of My Dad, yeah. um, just because, like, you know, she has great experts, actually, Eric Bollert, who passed away two years ago, who was an incredible voice for yeah. the people and media issues, um, is, is heavily featured in that documentary. Um, you know, it really details for you and shows you sort of like the the formula of like the Fox broadcast, the big takeaway for me, and, and it's been a little while since I watched it is, is how it's, it's literally like a psychological operation. They, they throw all this nonsense at you throughout the day. And then they like hit you with something that is just like really wacky, not true. Um, and they sort of 
you know, keep you watching and disorient you and then hit you with, um, with mis and disinformation. So, yeah. um, yeah, I don't know. That was perfect. No, our viewers know Jen Sanko and it's a very important reminder that documentaries are very, very critical tools in the fight that we are involved in right now. And as you're speaking, I'm thinking how many times we've had people on this show and it reminds me that the countries that are attacking us, uh, there's multiple stories breaking on, on Russia in um, getting uh, again ramped up and involved in our news sphere. These are countries that do not have any freedoms. They don't have freedom of the press. They don't have a first amendment. They're continually weaponizing our freedoms to basically harm us and psychologically manipulate us. And your regulatory capture comment was very, very important. Um, it just made me think of an investigation I was working on that dealt with Mike Johnson and some other politicians in 2018, taking money from Russian oligarchs through a cutout that the FEC wanted to uh, make further, you know, take further actions against these oligarchs, but it was divided along party lines. And that was again, a tragedy. And then we tried to a few years ago, come up with a way to handle disinformation, the Biden administration and the woman that they put in charge, Nina Jankowicz was relentlessly psychologically harmed and abused by the same people who were running uh, MAGA 3X in 2016. And so we have this big, huge monster that we grapple with, which is the external uh, disinformation. But we also have this terrible inability to protect people from you know what used to be called marketing lies. And I'm bringing this up because I drove my son to LAX yesterday and I saw three billboards along the way that said Epoch Times, number, number one trusted news. That is psychological manipulation. That is not true. And I just learned in a meeting this morning with my byline uh, supplement uh, uh, partners in the UK, UK will not allow that. But in America, the billboard company goes ahead and takes the money. And we, how do we agitate our way out of that? Like, what do you recommend we do uh, for those who are continually ingesting uh, psychological manipulation in their news spheres? Yeah. I mean, we are blessed uh, in this country uh, to have a First Amendment and to have so much robust um, you know, legal philosophy and uh, established precedent behind uh, the ability to, uh, you know, say whatever we want, right? So, and I don't believe that we should really mess too much with that. You know, the things that we can do, we can't say, hey, the Epic Times is, or however we pronounce it, is, is not allowed to do that, right? But what we can do is, you know, understand all of these forces, understand like you're talking about that, that, you know, foreign countries, foreign agents are trying to manipulate our media, that, you know, the extremely wealthy uh, are already and have been for a while, you know, uh, owning media, consolidating media um, and, and spreading mm -hmm. their agendas and narratives to all of us. And the ultimate solution, we can talk about some other stuff and some other stuff that we work on uh, as best we can, but the ultimate solution is to have a more robust public media in our country, right? Because we have this wonderful First Amendment, you know, the, the most important thing that we can do is sort of lift all information boats. And, you know, when you look at the world's healthiest democracies, they spend per capita on public media between 80 and $120 per capita. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we spend $3.16. And that's a combination <laughs> of local, state, and federal, right? Okay. And so, you know, when people talk about public media, it's very easy for the right to make these ad hoc attacks that like, that's the government, you know, telling you what to think through yeah. media. But you know, there are examples all over the world of, you know, appropriate firewalls, independent oversight. And there's examples of really cool stuff in America right now. Uh, D.C. just, um, you know, 
speaking of our information ecosystem and the ability to learn things, I spent a little time before I came on here trying to find out if this had passed or not, because I know DC, I think, just did pass their budget. I couldn't find it. But um, introduced in the fall, last fall in DC, was this, um, what is it called? Local Journalism Funding Act, I believe. And what that would do is wow. it would give money to citizens. Um, it would be 0.1% of the entire budget. So it's not bankrupting anything else. And journalism is essential to democracy. And it would give people money that they could spend on outlets uh, of their choosing. And, you know, you could say, well, what if they choose disinformation outlets? Again, we have this First Amendment. But what we can do is we can give people the tools to be able to spend money in a time when we don't have the money to spend for on subscriptions to all manner of outlets and to support local news, which is dying, right? We can figure out ways to, to democratize our media, to support a diversity of voices, um, you know, to detach ourselves from the commercialized system and say, you know, actually this like local journalism outlet is really like talking to like what I'm concerned about and I want to be able to support them. Well, programs like the one in DC that may happen or did just happen, uh, you know, those kinds of things, if we can push for that across the country, you know, that's a major step forward. It all requires a, a holistic effort, right? Yeah. But once we know things like, like that democracies that are healthy, have more spending on public media, we can say, hey, that sounds like a good idea. And we can start to agitate for that. And there is legislation in many states across the country that is, you know, thinking about ways to fund local journalism, to direct funds like in New York City in 2019, you know, de Blasio signed an executive order that was, you know, 50% of all, you know, advertising that the city government does, right? They have a budget for that. 50% of that has to be directed to community and ethnic uh, newspapers, right? Wow. And that's a way to, you know, you know, offset what we've unfortunately built for ourselves, which is this commercialized system whose first priority is not informing us, but instead yeah. profit. Thank you so much for that. High five. So, yeah, once again, capitalism has uh, been exploited. Uh, this is another uh, vulnerability that America has. Uh, you know, first is our information sphere, um, our First Amendment. Second is capitalism in that we have seen over the past few decades a consolidation of media outlets, of corporate media outlets, into the hands of a few corporations, right? And this is just across the board, basically. Um, some of those corporations are slightly more people focused, but at the end of the day, as you said, they are profit focused. Um, is there any federal motion towards supporting journalism across the board that you know of? Uh, before you answer that, I was just going to say, like, when we had the New Deal, they supported writers and playwrights and there was money to help people. Why can't we have a New Deal for journalism when it's so necessary? And in your answer, make sure that you also direct people to your local journalism directory, because that's really important. Sure. So it's a one big cycle, right? Uh, we can't have... Um, a new deal on journalism because of the journalism that we have. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. right? like, what, what we like to say is that media has to be your first priority, no matter what you care about, right? Yes. Like we can't have a functioning democracy if we don't fix our media. So we can't get right. that new deal until we start agitating for, okay. you know, a new deal. Right. And so there are things that are going through, uh, the federal government that are being, um, you know, sponsored. Um, some of them are better than others, right? There was um, maybe some of your your uh, viewers are aware of the Journalism Competition and Protection Act, the JCPA, which, um, you know, a lot of people criticize. And I think we co-sign those criticisms that, you know, more so than anything that would you know, direct revenue uh, to like the big players already who have the ability to meet with 
the social media companies and negotiate, you know, uh, a, a better, uh, better slice of the pie. Mm-hmm. Right. So that, that was this legislation that was sponsored by Amy Klobuchar, um, which I think is still alive, you know, which is a good idea in theory. Like let's get, you know, these, these social media companies make lots of money off of, you know, sp- spreading around journalism that other people create. Um, so let's like figure out a way to get, those journalists and and their 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 companies uh you know paid uh but you know it, it, it it's not maybe one of the best approaches um in its slightly different vein there's the press act which is a, a senate bill right now um which would protect journalists and their sources right so that's not so much about funding but like there's there's people thinking about it there's something called uh hr 4756 which is the community news and small business support act great name, uh, flows off the tongue. Uh, <laughs> what, what that would do is it would um, allow small businesses and employers of journalists to get tax credits um, for adver- if they advertise in local media, and it would you know subsidize the hiring of, of some journalists at, at the outlets. So there are these things that exist, and it's on all of us to unfortunately try to figure out how to be aware of them. One way you yeah. can is to pay attention to what we do, pay attention to what, um, you know, you know, often journalism schools will have like an institute or something attached to them. Um, You know, like UNC does. uh, There's the Neiman Lab. um, You know, there's the Columbia Journalism Review. There are ways to tune yourself into this world. You could listen to on the media. Um, You could pay attention to media critics like um, Mark Jacob or Dan Frumkin who are less telling you about the legislation that I'm telling you about, but you'll become more media savvy if you start to tune into these things. And then to get to your point about, you know, what do people do? It's hard. Like people can barely like focus on anything, let alone these, these extremely important things, uh, you know, about supporting journalism and and therefore democracy. So what we've done is um, we've created a local journalism directory. Um, and you know, that's on our website and it's, uh, it covers all 50 States. It covers our our territories, um, as well. And, you know, we would tell people, we found ourselves, you know, in our activism, telling people like, look, we need to support local journalism instead of like, and remove ourselves from this commercialized, you know, system of informing us. And, you know, local journalism is more trusted by people. uh, And, you know, it's it's the bedrock of democracy. Right. There's less corruption uh, in places where there's robust local journalism. There's more voting like it literally is hand in glove with democracy. And so, you know, it's like, well, we can tell people to do that. But how where are they going to go? How are they going to make that decision? So we have our methodology on there. You can read it. You can decide if, you know, we're, we're trustworthy people. But uh, my colleague, Jonathan, has, you know, really tirelessly worked to cultivate. Um, and, and by referencing, you know, the, the independent news network, um, you know, their list, right? Um, other that we have a, a, a series of lists that we that we went and we looked at and we we tried to emphasize um, journalism that covers state government, because that's really key. You know, as of 2018, 81% of all uh, local TV stations did not have a reporter uh, on the beat of the state capital, right? Um, what goes on in your state capital has ramifications, deep ramifications uh, for your life and for your locality. And so we have this local journalism directory. We made it really searchable. Um, easy to use. And so if you're like, hey, you know what, I'm fed up with the New York Times, uh, you know, just both sides in this fascist rise in our country. Well, guess what? The seven billion dollar New York Times is going to be OK. And you're still going to like find out about their scoops like, you know, on social media or whatever. So take that money, pull it out of our commercialized system and fund these local journalism outlets. And let's like do our part um, outside of legislation to just, you know, be citizens who care and who are boosting local journalism by subscribing or donating. 
That was beautiful. That was so perfect. Thank you so much for that. I've got one more um, question I want to go over with you. You know, we just interviewed uh, our friend Paul Conroy, a war correspondent in Ukraine, and he said the most important thing right now is to find trusted sources. So thank you for all the work that you put into that. People are very unaware that somebody in the Philippines can be offered money to create a Facebook page that looks like it's a local page when the whole entire job is to discredit a local candidate or whatever they're they're supposed to put their target at. So having some place that they can go is very, very important because we want to do everything we can to protect people from disinformation, particularly when they just don't there's still there's still a naivete that if it says it's called, you know, Los Angeles Daily.com, that it's something that's legit. And that is not the case. So my final point is that a couple breaking stories just came through. One about doppelganger sites, which imitate some of the larger newspapers, as well as the pink slime sites, which are sites that uh, Financial Times uh, just did a uh, report on these um Russian spoofed sites, so local news being swamped by this. And is there anything that in, in your time and your experience with the Media and Democracy Project that you can sort of help people to kind of raise their, I don't know if cynicism is the right word, but to, to be more vigilant about their news hygiene? Sure, absolutely. I would say a first rule of thumb is that like, if it's like seems too good to be true, uh, if it really just makes you, if it animates every part of your, you know, snake brain and you're like, wow, you know, yeah. um, it, it's worth investigating like where that information is coming from. Um, and that's just like a first start. Uh, but then we can also start simply, right? Like, is there a byline on what you're reading, you know, um, what does their about section say uh, of a news source that you're looking at? Um, I actually did a little like before I came on, I did a little um, experiment where um, I, I, I was reading through that Financial Times article. Um, and so I went to one of the one of the pink slime outlets that was listed in there. And then I went to um, one of the outlets that that you know, we're a fan of and that we've been monitoring as we're looking at, you know, who is actually doing pro-democracy election coverage. So I compared the uh, Arizona Mirror and their About Us section uh, to the About Us section of the Chicago City Wire. Um, the reason I chose the Arizona Mirror is because uh, they have an article that they came out with um, in February that uh, was titled We're Ditching Junk Food Election Coverage to Focus on What's at Stake When We Vote, which mm -hmm. is like that should sort of make you immediately aware that like, OK, I don't think this is someone trying to trick me like right. care about voting. Right. But if you look at the funding uh, information on the Chicago City Wire, it says funding for this news site is provided in part by advocacy groups who share our beliefs in limited government. Okay, and there's no links to anything, <laughs> nothing like that, right? The Arizona Mirror's about section says Arizona Mirror is an affiliate of States Newsroom, which is definitely a great organization. Um, the nation's largest state-focused nonprofit news organization, supported by grants and donations. And there's a clickable link, and you can go and see, you know, like more about that, right? So, um, and they also, you know, they claim, and anybody can claim anything, but the mirror retains full editorial independence, right? So it's about what they say about themselves. Um, it's about who funds them, if you can find that out. Yeah. Um, do they talk about their values in their about section? Um, do they, you know, uh, stress a commitment to reporting factual information? Um, or is it like just a few lines that like sort of mimic that? And I do want to say, like, it's tough. It yeah. is really, really tough. You may have seen this article recently about um, the Richmond Standard in California, which is owned by Chevron, right? <laughs> and there's a Chevron like plant in the town. And there were like explosions or like a leak or whatever, and people could see it in the sky. And the only local paper there is the Richmond Standard. And they didn't report on it, right? <laughs> like, go figure, right? But, but in the Richmond Standards about section, right? 
they say, quote, they are the number one source for local community driven news. Yeah. Right. So that freedom of speech, anyone can say anything. But it's about us being able to like have our own sniff test. Yeah. And, you know, so if you can find information about ownership, if you can find if they're affiliated with like a journalism school or a pro pro journalism, pro democracy effort, like a report for America. Right. Like if they have a, a, a reporter who is there uh, funded by report for America, like, you know, that is people who care about journalism first who are, you know, engaging with this news outlet and that news outlet is interested in that program, right? It takes work. I'm sorry to yes. say it takes work, but yes. increasingly everything about being a pro-democracy citizen <laughs> takes work in this day and age where, yes, both both uh, domestic and foreign uh, 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 interests are are waging an information war against us. And I just want to say one last thing on this. Sure on this pink slime thing, because you're right. You're right. Like they are figuring out ways to manipulate our more democratic system. And one of those ways I was reading in that financial times article, and I'll just read the quote. Um, this is from the article Duke university's, uh, Napoli, um, is a researcher that they were talking to said that pink slime sites can avoid having to follow campaign disclosure and communications rules because the federal election commission grants media outlets an exemption. He called on the FCC to quote more rigorous, rigorously apply to the media exemption to make sure they fit the criteria. So like they're waging, you know, the, the arrayed against democracy information war uh, contingent is waging an all fronts war. And we all just, I'm sorry, but we all just need to like pick up our, our pens and engage our minds and get to our keyboards and just care. You yeah. just have to care and you just have to try as hard as you can. And it is really hard to be a more informed um, consumer of, of news. But you just made it easier. And that FT article does um, direct people to something called newsguardtech.com if people are curious. I've been sitting here trying to investigate newsguardtech.com to make sure I could refer people to it, but it looks like a good tool. But the Media and Democracy Project is also available to people. Where do people find uh, all your good information? Yeah. Uh, so you can go to media and democracy project.org um, and you can learn about, you know, the efforts that, that you've, you've put up on the screen, which is really cool. You can sign those petitions, um, those open letters. Um, a, a project that I would like to get going is to really build out the website as, as a, a resource, like we're talking about that, yeah. you know, covers sort of all aspects of this holistic approach gives you points you towards legislation points you towards you know the the most you know uh current thoughts about you know how we can get public media like all of those kinds of things um mm -hmm. you can also follow us uh you know look we we can't not be on Twitter because that's still where uh, yeah. a lot of the conversation is happening yeah. um and so we are still on Twitter and you can follow us uh, at, at Fix Media Now. Uh, and you can also follow us at media, oh, sorry, at mad underscore democracy. Um, and when you go to those, you can find links to, you know, other, we're trying to be everywhere, but. So, so perfect. You can also read all of their headline corrections, which I always really appreciate because the normalization uh, is part of this, uh, which which is part of, I think, which enables regulatory capture. I really, yesterday there was an article about, you know, Robert Mercer, you know, uh, bringing people together to fund, you know, Trump's campaign. And it was done in that way that we watched since 2016, which did not reveal any of the pertinent details like Cambridge Analytica financing, Breitbart, Parler, Citizens United, all the things that make him, a, a, you know, in particular, a 
wrecking ball of you know democracy. Um, so we have our work cut out for us, but you just made it a bit easier. And I do believe that people need to remember just how much power they actually do have. And um, I'm glad you're on the case. Anything, any, uh, any final words? Uh, I could speak on all this forever, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, what's always been inspiring to me is uh, the phrase, we make the road by walking. And um, you just literally have to uh, take steps forward. And so that's what we're doing. Um, yeah. For sure, your viewers in their own way uh, have been doing that, but really can't stress enough that whatever your first priority is, uh, media and media reform had better been better be uh, like one A, uh, yeah. not even your second priority, but like a yeah. contingent priority because, you know, without coverage of workers' rights, without, you know, uh, you know, extensive coverage of, of climate or, you know, extensive coverage of what all Americans are feeling, not just what Trump supporters and diners are feeling, right? Like we can't get a full <laughs> picture of our neighbors and we can't get a full picture of solutions. And, you know, we need to demand pro-democracy media that gives us context, truth and transparency in every piece of reporting. We need to expect that. Right. And, 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 and ask to be respected by the current media system that we have. And then long term change the the fundamental structure of the media and information system that we have. Oh, I love it. I think that's so important. So listen out there, kids, do not get your news from Aunt B's Facebook page, okay? I personally have a bunch of Substack writers that I support because there are people whose voices and analysis are what I want, but there's still great journalism being done. Know how to find it and know how to protect yourself better. I feel like we got one step closer today. High five, final thought. When I think about all the things we've been talking about, about the fake news, about the billionaires propping up Trump, the fact that the Speaker of the House referred to the January 6th attempted coup as people walking through the building, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think about the, the story you just told, Brian, about the Chevron-owned newspaper that yeah. didn't report upon their explosions. And all I can think of is is george orwell the party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears it was their final most essential command <laughs>